we have to make it clear to people that the creation of the single currency um, had preconditions which some of which were ignored you know and we created we went a little bit too fast maybe uh, we created a currency uh, you know, with not all the conditions that are in place. And, and now we have to say to people, OK, you have to make a choice now. So we are very happy to have Andrew Watt with us, who uh, is now head of macroeconomic research at um, uh, IMK, the institute in uh, Germany, uh, for, financed by the Hans Böckler Foundation in Düsseldorf. And uh, prior to that, he was uh, one of the senior economists at the European Trade Union Institute in Brussels. In the center of your analysis is the issue of uh, external imbalances. Uh, they are, of course, internal to the Eurozone, but they are external from different countries' point of view. And you put that as very much a core problem with which the Eurozone has to deal with, and probably also the core of why uh, the Eurozone did very badly following the financial and economic crisis. Probably my first question is uh, explore that a little bit and tell us the sort of mechanisms which were at work to generate these, but also to possibly resolve them. And in the second part, you will tell us whether institutionally the Eurozone is able to deal with that problem also in the longer run and what proposals you have. I would start with, let's say, the more traditional analysis, which actually focused very much more on the uh, public uh, deficits and, and okay. debts. This was widely seen, especially in the country in which I now work, mm. uh, as, as, the, as the major issue running up to the, uh, to the crisis. And, and my... And, the analysis of, of our institute, and, and, and not just of us, of course, other, other colleagues, um, has focused much more on the issue of uh, yeah, macroeconomic imbalances, or in, in short, the, the trade and, and, uh, and current account imbalances between the, uh, the euro area countries. That's, that's in, um, entirely right. And, and I mean, the, the short answer is that uh, uh, the countries that are uh, running deficits um, have to go into debt. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, uh, ultimately, it was... Uh, a crisis, most cases uh, in the crisis countries in the private sector, Greece arguably also in the public sector or more in the public sector, um, of indebtedness and behind that was essentially, uh, you know, credit bubbles in, in, in places like Spain and Ireland um, and excessive uh, government spending in, in places like Greece, which led to an accumulation of debt and there was the sudden uh, stop in the, in the crisis for initially external reasons, you know, the, the crisis uh, coming in from, from, from the US initially, um, and that was what sparked off uh, the, the problems we've had. In fact, uh, in, uh, also in your analysis, uh, what is very much in the public domain is the evolution of labor unit costs and behind that productivity and wage dynamics, which I think you also emphasize, but you take a slightly different slant on that from the traditional discussion about widely diverging labor unit costs. Am I right? Yes, that? yes. I, mm -hmm. I think, I mean, be, behind that was indeed, and in that sense, we, we, I have a very, fairly standard view, um, that uh, behind that was the situation that Germany, to a lesser extent Austria, uh, was constantly, as it were, underperforming or, or overperforming, if you like, in terms of uh, unit labor costs. I had below average unit labor mm -hmm. cost developments and price developments. And the, the countries I've just been talking about, like take Spain, uh, you know, had, had higher rates, uh, higher than average rates. And, you know, so the ECB was essentially hitting its price target, but that was an average of w what was proved to be unsustainable, you know, excessive mm -hmm. inflation and, and unit labor cost developments in, in countries like Spain. And uh, uh, excessively low rates in, in countries like Germany and, to be honest, mm -hmm. uh, also in Austria. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, and, and, th and that proved to be a problem. And I think... Uh, you know, moving a bit towards the solutions, mm -hmm. uh, a way to influence that uh, is, is an important part of, of any strategy to, to uh, you know, ensure balanced growth in, uh, in, in the euro area. Uh, I would like to emphasize, though, that it's not just an issue of directly latching on to uh, wages. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I think it's more, more complex than that. Uh, first of all, I, I would say it, uh, I, I differ from, from, the, from the views in, in, in some places like... I think the commission to some extent still, um, which does see the wage and price problem, but sees it in a very sort of one-sided way. So it's mm -hmm. essentially, it's just a problem of the, 
you know, the deficit mm -hmm. countries, if you like, and I th you know, my view is very much that it's also a problem of, uh, of, the, uh, of the surplus countries. Um, but uh, having said that, I think you know, what we need to move towards is a system where, indeed, where, where there is a scope for using incomes policies, and Austria, I think, would be mm -hmm. a, a good example with your, your, your corporatist uh, structures. Um, countries with a with a with a high and important minimum wage like France could also have some some advantages in this case to actually use incomes policy proactively to try and stabilize rates, you know, around uh, the, the, the medium term average that all countries should, should be trying to hit, and and those countries that, that that don't do that or or generally in any case countries will have to use counter cyclical fiscal policy. You know, we ha we have a single interest rate. Um, We've seen in the, in the run-up to the crisis that this single interest rate led to perverse real interest rates. So the, the countries which had higher inflation uh, would have needed higher real interest rates, but they had lower real mm -hmm. real rates, and the opposite in the in the in the surplus countries. Um, so we need to take concrete steps to to resolve that, and that 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 means uh, uh, you know ensuring. I think ultimately, I mean, it's politically difficult, I know, but ultimately dropping the. Uh, the fiscal rules uh, that can't be done from one day to the next, but I think we need to to move towards that and and to have rules which are, you know, explicitly counter cyclical, but in both uh, directions, uh, you know, that affect both the uh, surplus countries and uh, the deficit countries, or the high inflation countries and the low inflation countries. So, uh, in in a sense, uh, if I understand you, you have two lines of argumentation. One is some coordination of incomes policy, uh, and I will ask you how. Uh, since uh, incomes policy and wage negotiations were very much nationally evolving, how realistic it is to have a coordination framework across the European Union. And the second point you make about fiscal, uh, uh, that there has to be an evolution of fiscal policy, which is basically stabilizing across the European uh, uh, Eurozone, meaning the countries which require more expansion to uh, uh, because they have a negative hit to their business cycle, would get some leeway in terms of uh, more expansionary mm. fiscal policy. But then, of course, one always uh, the question is always raised. Uh, this means um, some sharing <laughs> of uh, debt responsibility across mm. the European Union. And this is, of course, one of the core issues uh, where we see there's little willingness yeah, at the European, uh, at the Eurozone level yeah. uh, to uh, take that on board. That's, that's true. I mean, uh, I mean the, the clean solution to the Euro area's problems is to make it you know, a sort of federal state along mm -hmm. the lines of, of Germany or, or Austria mm -hmm. or other European countries. Uh, then a lot of the problems we have, we, we could resolve, as it mm -hmm. were, uh, um, overnight in that way. But uh, as you pointed out, uh, you know, there is no appetite for moving. This is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. no appetite. So the thing to do is to come up with solutions which you know, are incrementalist and can build on existing institutions. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've tried to do with, mm -hmm. a, uh, with a colleague uh, associated with, uh, with the IMK. Um, and well, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a long story, to be honest with you. Yeah. But, I, mean, I think there are, there are institutions that are either uh, in place or are being put into place now like these famous competitiveness on our productivity councils, mm -hmm. like the new uh, fiscal authority for the euro area, which offer a sort of nucleus, if you like, mm -hmm. for the sort of institutions that one would need uh, to, to develop. Uh, so we don't need to really totally rewrite all the treaties, although I think ultimately we will have to, but not, not immediately, you know, to see some progress. No? For example, um, you know, to, to make the fiscal authority to broaden its, its membership and to, to, to give it a wider remit, if you like, for the policy, for the policy mix you know, mm -hmm. sort of, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, how does monetary policy and fiscal policy and uh, incomes developments or incomes policies, how do they interact? Uh, uh, you know, what scenarios can we develop to, to, to find consistent paths for these different policy areas? These are the sort of things you could do without a big, you know, revolution in the treaties and without, uh, you know, confronting people, if you like, with the need to make a a step in integration that perhaps they're not uh, not willing to uh, willing to do now. You know, um, I mean, I think uh, the the issue of uh, moral hazard, as you know, mm -hmm, the, the, mm -hmm. which, which mm -hmm. you raised, uh, you know, that people will have to stand in, as it were, for other for the mistakes that other people might might have to make. I mean, I think uh, well, there's a big discussion about that, as, mm -hmm. as you know, and lots of different views. Uh, I mean, I think. Th 
there, there is moral hazard in any uh, mm -hmm. community, you know, in any insurance community. Uh, I mean, I, I think if we can get out of the crisis, then people, you know, people recognize it at the, at the national level. Uh, they should be willing to, to share some uh, uh, responsibility, um, uh, yeah, and also some risk, uh, if they perceive it's in their longer term interest. And of course, this is, uh, you know, something that can't be resolved overnight. But I think that's the way we have to go. I think we have to make it clear to people that the creation of the single currency um, had preconditions, which some of which were ignored. You know, and we created. We went a little bit too fast. Maybe uh, we created a currency, uh, you know, with not all the conditions that are in place. And, and now we have to say to people, okay, you have to make a choice now. You know, mm -hmm. uh, if we want to keep the the, the 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 common currency, which is what I think most people want, and that's what the opinion polls also suggest, uh, then we need to take integration steps and let's talk about the best ones, the, let's say perhaps the easiest ones to do, the most important ones and the easiest ones and let's, let's get them done. And if not, then we, of course we have to have a discussion about the, the dissolution of the, uh, of the euro area. But I don't see, I see some countries where this, this feeling, for reasons I understand to some extent, is, is growing. Um, but I don't see a majority, as it were, in, 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 throughout the European Union or within, within the European Monetary Union area, uh, European area countries, mm -hmm. sorry. Um, I, I don't see uh, majorities wanting to, to dissolve the, um, no. the, front, the, the single currency because we, people who have a lot, slightly longer memories are also aware of the situation before that, which is not optimal either, right? No, so we're yeah. not talking about optimal There were exchange rate crises here, yes. and, yes. <laughs> exactly, yeah. we're not talking about Optima here. Yes. Do you think a, a minimum condition for the survival is some increase in the EU budget and the use of some of that increase as a, for a stabilization function? Uh, I don't think it's absolutely necessary. I think mm -hmm. it, would, it would be we helpful. I mean, uh, you know, people have looked at the different monetary arrangements that have been existed in history and, the, the, you know, there's no case of of a monetary union like like the EMU with a, essentially a 1% uh, budget. I mean, this, this has not existed yet. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean to say it's not impossible, but there are some, there are some uh, proposals along there, uh, you know, for a, for a common budget. But I think in theory, at least, you know, one, one could have uh, some cross-border stabilization, for example, through a, 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 a basic uh, um, European Union uh, unemployment insurance mm -hmm, fund. Mm -hmm. uh, the proposals are on the table mm -hmm, now, mm -hmm. also in quite a detailed way. Mm -hmm. There are different ways to, to set up such a scheme with trade-offs in there. But this could be an alternative that would, that would imply some cross-border stabilization. Um, but if you like, run a little bit implicitly, it wouldn't be a formal budget in that sense. Mm -hmm. no, it would have that effect depending on the ups and downs of the business cycle in different countries. Coming back to the coordination of incomes policy, since you worked at the European Trade Union Institute, how prepared are basically the trade union organizations for a much stronger coordination in that sphere? Well, I think uh, they have tried. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, you know, the, the ETUC uh, and the, some of the uh, sectoral unions at the European level, like the metal workers, the, the chemical workers, which are now merged, uh, for example, in the public sector uh, unions, they have made efforts at the European level. Um, it's probably fair to say that for collective bargainers, you know, at the, at the local, regional or even national level in, in, in some of the uh, member countries, mm. the decisions and recommend recommendations made in Brussels will probably seem uh, uh, quite far away, you know, and yeah. rather divorced from their day-to-day -day mm -hmm, market. Mm -hmm. And I think, that's, I think that's certainly the case at the moment. I mean, you asked before about the, the practicality of, of, of wage bargaining, so perhaps just two sentences on that. I mean, you know, we don't need euro area-wide bargaining. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't need that. We don't even need, a, I think, a very active coordination between countries or between unions or between uh, employers, for that matter. Um, we don't need to uh, change national wage setting mm -hmm, systems mm -hmm. in a fundamental way, although we probably need to get a bit more, you know, coverage of collective agreements would certainly be helpful. Um, but we need, we need to have some basic agreement at some, you know, uh, not just very decentral level, so at the sector or the national level, we need to have some basic agreement on, a, on an appropriate wage norm, nominal wage norm. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the economic discussion, uh, you know, most people of different economic mm. schools agree what that mm. norm should be. Productivity. Right? Productivity yeah, plus an allowance for yeah. prices. Mm -hmm. There are some mm -hmm. details one can discuss. But, you know, if, if all wage earners sort of, you know, uh, 
get a wage increase that's in line with productivity plus the actually the target rate of inflation of the European Central Bank, then the whole economy you know, moves in a balanced way. Right? You don't get imbalances between the countries, which I'm concerned mm -hmm, about, mm -hmm. not just me. Uh, and you don't get a shift in the, in the share of income going to uh, labor or going, going to capital. Um, and you get uh, unit labor costs increasing in line with the inflation target of the central bank. So in this world, everybody's happy, right? So it's, I think we could fairly easily agree on that, mm -hmm. on that benchmark, right? And then we have to uh, think about how to ensure its implementation. Uh, and that's obviously, you know, it's not, a, it's not a binary thing, right? It's not either you, you, you don't manage at all or you, or you manage it 100%. If you, if you can move in this direction, then you ease the uh, adjustment pressure on the other actors in the system. That's Okay, Bye. thank you, Andrew, for uh, you this. Much, yes. If you want more uh, details, I think there will be uh, your presentation and we will give reference to your writings uh, on the website. Thank you, Andrew. Great, looking forward very much.